There's a lot of fancy highfalutin cassette decks out there. This isn't one of them. This is the very basic No Frills Technics M218 cassette deck. It was introduced in 1981 by the people that gave us Panasonic, again Technics, and was subsequently discontinued a year later. So these did not enjoy a very long production run. And I'm sure at this time, because cassette decks were really reaching their peak of popularity, people were going to be spending the big bucks getting the highest quality cassette deck they could get. And this M218 Technics cassette deck, well, was just very basic and didn't have too many bells and whistles. But there's something nice about going to use something that is just so simple and straightforward to operate. And I've been embarrassed to say that for the past four or five years, I have not had a cassette deck connected to my primary stereo system. I've had a turntable, and I've had a CD player, but I have not had a cassette deck. So I've had no way to listen to my absolutely overwhelmingly massive collection of cassette tapes. One of the issues I've come to realize is usually true with those really high quality, fancy cassette decks is there's a lot more that could go wrong with them and the sands of time usually get even with them more so than they do with something that is very basic and bare bones like this. This has uh, soft touch controls for activating the transport and also a soft eject mechanism so it doesn't just spring your tapes open, fling them open. This is a single capstan cassette deck mechanism. But excusing the dust, the pinch roller actually looks to be in acceptable condition. They even went to the trouble of putting this little orange sticker here so that when you go ahead and install, or I should say insert a cassette tape, it helps to make it a little bit easier to see how much tape is sitting on each of the take up and supply spools. This has a three digit mechanical tape counter with a reset button of course, a quarter inch stereo headphones jack for monitoring the audio, although there is no volume control you'd have to use something in line. One thing that this cassette deck does have going for it is the ability to play back the three different major tape types, be it metal, chrome, and normal bias cassette tapes. This has Dolby B noise reduction, which according to the reference material I was able to find online, claims to be able to reduce hiss by at least 10 dB, and also an input selector to go between the line level RCA cables, or the quarter inch microphone inputs for left and right stereo recording. Something I've never been much a fan of are the independent level controls. I know there's probably many people out there that like these things, but for dialing in the exact left and right volume or the levels of like recording off-air content from the radio or a turntable is a bit of an uphill battle with these independent volume controls but of course they are convenient if you happen to be recording using the microphone inputs. This does have a vacuum fluorescent peak level level meter display. It always made this kind of typewriter sewing machine sound in the background of it just sitting here idly. If I be quiet for just a moment you can probably hear that sewing machine sound. And with no cassette tapes actually uh, inserted in the deck, you can see that it defaults to metal, which lights up yellow. And then I go to eject it, and I'm gonna play, play this uh, normal bias type one tape. And that switches automatically over to indicating that's a normal tape. I don't have a chrome tape on hand, but you'll have to take my word for it that if I were to insert it, this would light up green. And I've had good experience with these Panasonic and Technics decks just kind of working out of the box. I mean, of course, there are the exceptions to the rule every now and again, but it has been my empirical first-hand experience that these things just usually work, and that's likely to do with just how simple they are and also how robust they were. Panasonic and Technics just seem to have a reputation in my mind for quality and durability. And I am rather disappointed that this thing got bashed around quite a bit in the many years of it being shuffled around in storage, such as this uh, deep gouge scratch and uh, the scuff marks over on this, uh, this cover here, although I'm likely going to buff that out and polish it out using some combination of vehicle headlight and plastic restoration products, and it may have some moderate amount of success. Likewise, the level meters are a little gashed up, but the tape counter is working correctly. Nice to see. So that uh, seems to be an accurate indication that the belts are probably okay for the time being. I'm not saying they're good. I'm sure they could stand to be replaced, but uh, this thing looks like it's playing at the correct speed just by my very, uh, you know, unscientific uh, observation here. Also seems like it's playing okay. I don't see it galloping in speed and doing all kinds of wow and flutter stuff that's really a sign of bad belts or something even worse. Go ahead and stop that, eject the tape, everything looks fine. 
What's nice too is that uh, Panasonic was thinking ahead and they made it so that you can just lift the this decorative cover off of the actual tape door and have very easy access for cleaning the tape head, the pinch roller, and the cap stand, which I just discovered is the source of that noise. It just sits there and spins so long as this thing is powered up. And with that door removed, you can almost just sneak a little screwdriver in there to adjust the azimuth alignment of the tape head. Come over to the rear of the deck is the customary permanently fixed power cord and RCA line level input and output cables. Look at that. Made in Japan by Matsushita Electronic uh, Electric Industrial Corporation. And there's a service use only hole in the cover for adjusting the speed of the motor. And what's nice about these things is you have one and two screws. Of course, ignoring the little warning here about not removing screws because of an electrical shock hazard. Now with those two screws removed, just have to lift up on the cover. And that's it. We're inside. Now this is no Model M, but uh, this might as well be a buckling spring key switch. There's a little spring in there. The belts themselves actually look to be in acceptable condition. They really don't seem like they're sagging. That's the one for the tape counter. And you've got this large one that's uh, sitting on the flywheel. And then we've got one sitting over there that's much smaller in size. And everything looks okay. I don't see any of the telltale traces of deteriorating belts like that uh, black goo that's just about inescapable and gets on everything. I don't see any signs of that here, so that's always a, a good thing. And it looks like the brand name for the vacuum fluorescent display is Futaba. Could very well be wrong. I'm trying to read that uh, through the LCD screen of the camera. Made in Japan. I've got this board kind of hanging off of it. Little uh, cattywampus. And looks like there's actually adjustment here for setting the sensitivity of the level meters. As it says right there, 20, negative 20 dB adjustment. And then there's one right over here for 0 dB adjustment. There's the very beefy power transformer. Now I'm no cassette deck expert, but uh, I am going to lean toward saying that this very large rod is what's responsible for activating record mode. In fact, what I'll do is put a cassette tape in here that uh, I'm going to tape over these uh, little indicators to the deck that it's uh, not recordable tape. I can place that in now. I've got it connected up to power now and I'm going to press the record button while also leaving it paused so we hopefully don't tape over too much material on that tape. And sure enough, that is the record switch, that little rod goes all the way over here and is acu activated electronically because this is a soft touch electronic uh, mechanism, it's not fully manual. And when you press the record button, look at the rod right there and its position. It always made this sound. I never once had a problem with its reliability. And you can see that everything, uh, some of these gears and cogs of the mechanism are moving in place even though it's not actually playing a tape. The mechanism is set to stop and it's not playing or doing anything. You can also get a better look at the little micro switches that are activated when you insert a tape and close the switches. I have two Q-tips I'm going to use to depress those little micro switches and sure enough you might be able to see the tape type selector flashing over there so those are what's responsible for indicating to the cassette deck and setting it properly and also indicating on the front panel which tape you currently have inserted. There's also quite a bit of trimmers in here on the board itself for adjusting different things like the play level, uh, bias adjustment, and uh, among a few other things that I can't quite get a good look at because the camera's in the best position to well, take a better look, but you'll have to take my word for it. Quite a bit of different adjustment that you can make to this thing, although I'm not going to go poking around in here. And now for the fun part, to give this thing a bit of a facelift and uh, return some of its lost luster over the years. I'm going to start out with this Blue Magic Metal Polish Cream that I've had good success with in the past for cleaning up, well, polished metal. And even though I'm not holding my breath too hard, I'm going to give it a go and see if it could clean up the 
level knobs these just pull off and so I can try to clean these up as best as I can and I'm also going to try to use that to remove some of the scratches and scuffs in the case I'm not expecting a miracle but it should clean up then for this scratched and scuffed plastic cover over the level meter I'll give this Meguiar's plastic cleaner and polish compound a go because I'm certainly not striving for perfection just an improvement over what we currently have it may not come across too well on camera, but I'd say that the uh, cassette compartment door, the uh, plastic glass, whatever you want to call this thing, cleaned up very well. It's very easy to take this whole door apart. Normally the piece of plastic uh, that says Technics will sit in here, and there's two of these Phillips screws that screw into here, and then on the front part are these little threaded inserts. They actually serve a purpose. That's what the screws go into. I don't know about anybody else, but I think that the plastic cover for the level meter came out pretty well. I'm having almost a mirror-like reflection out of it now, which is a lot more than can be said for what we originally started with. It's not going to win any awards, but I think it looks a lot better than what we started with, and it actually has a bit of a shine to it now. That metal polish ended up doing pretty well with the case cover and the faceplate as well. I was very careful not to be a bit too rambunctious applying the compound because of course there's always the possibility of it removing this uh, printing here, the different uh, writing and stuff on the faceplate. It has happened to me before in the past. Even the input level knobs cleaned up very nicely. The only thing that's next up on my agenda that I'm a bit unsure of how to tackle is how to remove the yellowing of the plastic surrounds by the Dolby noise reduction, the input selector switches, as well as the plastic surround by the tape counter. So if anybody has any suggestions on what is the best way to tackle that, I would certainly welcome hearing from you in the comments. Now we've tackled the cosmetic end of things, time to move on to the actual performance side of uh, cleaning this unit up. And that is going to begin with cleaning the head, erase head, as well as the cap stand and pinch roller. Yeah, the tape head definitely needed a cleaning. If you thought the tape head was bad, look at what came off the pinch roller. And now with the cleaning having concluded, I can go ahead and reinstall this front cover here. I think you gotta have the door open to do this. And it just slides right in like that. And there you go. Only problem I've noticed is that the left channel does seem to be slightly louder than that of the right. Could be that the tape head is a bit worn out. It does sound pretty good. And that's playing through a set of cheapy headphones right now because I don't have a speaker set up that I could bring over here and connect this thing to. I have taken a closer look at the playback level controls which are right there. I've taken note of their original positions. I fiddled with them back and forth and honestly I think that this level meter just isn't as accurate as it should be because I am listening with both ears now on of the headphones and it seems pretty well balanced. There's a little bit more volume on the left channel but it's nothing that's really going to cause major issues and I don't have one of those fancy cassette deck calibration uh, test tapes to get the speed dialed in but just by playing back 10 cc's I'm not in love it's very clear that this thing is playing a bit too slow so now I'm going to engage in some shenanigans off camera that is very unscientific and imprecise speed adjustment by playing the song 10 cc I'm not in love on tape and trying to sync it up as close as possible by ear to the version that I'm listening to digitally and get the pitch pretty close. This is not obviously for perfectionists or audiophiles, but it's gonna get the job done. Well, this is gonna win some awards and probably set off a flurry of angry, furious comments, but I found this little uh, jeweler's uh, screwdriver thing for repairing eyeglasses, and it's just small enough to reach in here because I don't have any screwdrivers big enough to go through this outer cover. Pretty happy with that. It took about five minutes of going back and forth with very minute adjustments to the playback speed. And I've got it now to where if I sync these both up, they keep playing in sync. Whereas before I got it really close, but not all the way. And it would eventually slightly fall out of sync. And then I made this a little too fast. So this would start playing in back a couple of milliseconds before the digital version but now I have it dialed in almost 100% I'm happy with that I'm gonna leave it as it is 
And now for some demonstrations of the audio fidelity capable with this Technics M218 from 1981. I have a very high quality, high fidelity, audiophile approved setup. That is to say, the headphone jack going to a quarter inch adapter, and then that runs into the line input of my MacBook, which is then being recorded by the QuickTime player in high quality setting. And that is the best it's going to get right now because this cam, I don't have any kind of a... Uh, an attenuation cable to bring this output to line output or even below that because technically the only input that's on this camcorder I'm recording with is a microphone input so even a line level output will still be way too hot of a signal and over modulate and clip So as you were able to both see and hear, despite being over 40 years old, this Tectix M218 from 1981 does an excellent job, at least in my opinion and to my untrained ears. Up next on my list of things to do with this thing is to replace its belts and hopefully to get a tape deck calibration tape. Not bad for almost being half a century old.